Good afternoon. This is the Agro Advantage Technical Series, the uh, Closure Turf Final Cover System. This is a 2016 technical series of agronars, as we like to call them. Um, the um, We've had uh, two prior to this on designing with closure turf, an engineered final cover system, which is a uh, fully tested long-term final cover system that's been accepted in several states now, is compliant with subtitle D for landfill closures, so able to use everywhere. Um, part one topics, just as a little bit of review, uh, part one we talked about infiltration equivalents using either the help model or actually using Drew equations instead of the help model nowadays. Um, hydrology and hydraulic design, cheat flow, concentrated flow, peak flow attenuation, shear strength design, static, maximum allowable slopes, seismic, veneer deformation or global stability, wind design, uh, field wind stability, wind shear force versus uplift, slope, hinge, stability, and geographic considerations. And in part two, we went into traffic, allowable static forces, acceleration, deceleration, longevity. That's uh, related to ultraviolet exposure in the field as measured in Arizona and lab testing in uh, uh, the Geosynthetic Research Institute and also geographic considerations for longevity and then also fire resistance and snow load. Here now in part three, we're going to talk about landf landfill gas relief systems using a uh, closure turf. Uh, first, we're going to go into some landfill gas generation that might be a little uh, um, review for, for some listening in today, but I'll go into some pretty uh, specific details and then landfill gas pressure forces which exist under closure turf and frankly underneath any final cover system. And then finally end the session with a uh, discussion about passive venting. Um, short agenda, it's a large topic. Uh, for some engineers out there, it's the mother of all landfill design issues. So, Control landfill gas, first off, it's, it's a must. You have to do it. Um, it's required under federal Title V for the larger sites, those with um, <clears throat> greater uh, design capacity of greater than 2.5 million megagrams, which is about 2.75 million tons, and which produce more than 50 megagrams per year of non-methane organic compounds, or NMOX. So for these type of sites, it's a must. Um, as we'll see later in here, for sites smaller than this, it might be a must for stability sake of the final cover system. Also, some states have applied greenhouse gas rules, such as the People's Republic of California here, that have lowered the d design capacity, frankly, below um, uh, gas heat content that's um, workable in a standard flare or what have you. So that can be, these greenhouse gas rules can be a real problem for uh, some landfills. And then some gas control methods work better than others, especially this one. Now why is this problem? Well beyond the regulatory rules, which resemble the IRS on some days, Landfills can get a case of bad gas. The closure turf final cover system isn't immune to this problem, but it won't see uh, catastrophes like the, these. Um, this site here uh, actually had a PVC liner, um, gas bubble developed underneath it, and the whole mess went sliding down the GCL subgrade within a few months after it was constructed. Here's what's colloquially known as a whale. This is a geomembrane poking up through the surround the above soil cover due to the gas pressure building beneath it. 
here's exposed uh, or GCL that uh, let's see a team of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, including the cameraman engineers had to discover. This is also a slope final cover slope failure, not as dramatic as these two, but it's still a failure. Uh, start off with some landfill gas basics. Um, basically, a landfill gas pressure collects beneath the geomembrane and it basically steals from the static shear resisting force, which is represented by this equation here. So you've got this resisting force in constant battle with this driving force trying to drag the final cover system down the slope. Resisting force is, is uh, formed by the weight of the cover system by the cosine of the slope angle to get the normal load and then from that we subtract the landfill gas pressure, multiply that whole equation by the uh, tangent of the interface shear angle and then divide that by this driving force here, which is simply the weight of the cover trying to go down this slope. We need to determine uh, values for the saturated soil cover and uh, the interface shear angle to determine what this critical landfill gas pressure is that will cause uh, uh, instability. Now, some might argue that the dry density is a more critical scenario, but I'm going to go with the idea here that since the saturated uh, weight of the soil cover occurs during storms when ambient air pressure is lower than it usually is, that allows more movement of landfill gas. So we can get a more critical situation underneath this geomembrane when there are storms around, we have low, low air pressure to counteract the, the gas pressure and a wetter uh, surface up here, thus more driving force to pull it down the slope, as well as resisting normal load. But again, the air pressure and wet surface can counteract those. So that's my theory and I'm sticking to it. Now, to determine that interface friction angle, uh, let's go back to this slide from the Part 1 Design Agronar. And you know, we've got uh, two conditions, peak and residual. We're going to work with residual strength here. And this is um, uh, soil interface friction of linear low super drip net versus soils, both cohesive soil and granular soils. Granular soils, in this case, are silty, sandy clays or clayey, sandy silts of soils of that sort that you're typically going to find on intermediate covers, landfill intermediate covers, versus a nice, pure, cohesive clay. So, the strength of the system generally follows this line, which is a linear regression of all these data points here. So we take the tangent of that line slope and we come up with a slope angle of almost 40 degrees. It's very sticky stuff. So now I can estimate the saturated weight of the sand ballast cover using a typical dry weight of sand at 110 pounds per cubic foot and solving for the void ratio in the following where G is the specific gravity of the sand, uh, gamma sub W here is the unit weight of water, and then here's E, the void ratio. Now G for a quartz sand is about 2.65, so we plug that in, back salt for uh, the void ratio, and I come up with a void ratio of 0 0.5. So now I'm going to plug that into this equation here and determine the saturated weight of the soil of that sand with um, saturation or S equals saturation at 1 and my wet sand weight is 130 pounds per cubic foot. Great, so now we got those two variables. Add into this the turf itself weighs about 26 ounces per square yard 
or 0 0.18 pounds per square foot. And 50 mil linear low super grit net weighs in at 0 0.41 pounds per square foot. So now we can solve for the landfill gas pressure. If the system weight, adding all those components together, is 6 pounds per square foot, now I plug that into the factor of safety equation, back calculate, depending on the values for factor of safety, uh, factor of safety of 1.0 or minimum imminent failure, landfill gas pressure is 0 0.66 inches of water column, not a lot. For a factor safety of 1.5, it's 0 0.45 inches a water column. So not a whole lot of difference. So obviously this system has to be vented to allow for uh, the inevitable times when the landfill gas control system will crash, be that a flare or a power plant. So if that control system crashes, how long until unstable conditions start to develop? Well, we'll explore that with a hypothetical landfill. A uh, nice square one, 100 acre pyramid shape. So boring it doesn't exist. Has 90 extraction wells across the top deck and side slopes here. Uh, this well field has the following design characteristics. The borehole depths are typically 100 feet. It's 4 inch well casing. The screen is 75 feet from the uh, bottom of the borehole up to within 25 feet of the surface. Separation is 204 feet, implying it's one well per acre with a radius of influence of almost 118 feet. Gas composition is 50-50 methane, CO2, and then all the other trace components combined that make it so nasty. And the system is operated at 10 to 15 inches of water column applied vacuum. Now, this is a representation of well separation versus radius of influence. And the purpose of this is to get full VIN, if you will, coverage of the land or the uh, solid waste in which this well field is placed. So if we have a radius of influence of 118 feet, basically, using this equation, you can calculate that S is 204 feet. So basically one well per acre. You can figure that each of these circles is about an acre. You can also calculate or estimate um, the extraction rate at each well using a soil vapor extraction equation here that I pulled from this reference down below. Uh, practical design calculations for groundwater and soil remediation. Now this equation is not meant for closed systems like a totally sealed landfill, but the difference is, is landfill gas is constantly being generated. So this equation still works because you have constant source of vapor coming into the system by biological action. So in this equation, we got Q sub W, which is the gas volumetric flow, T, the landfill gas extraction well screened interval of 75 feet, refuse permeability at 13.4 Darcy's, um, LFG viscosity, at this value here, the pressure at the extraction well is 10 inches of water column vacuum, actually. You've got to convert all that into absolute pressure values. And then the pressure of the waste mass out here at the radius of influence, about 75% of the wellhead vacuum. And then the radius of the extraction well, it's a 4-inch casing, and then radius of influence 117.8 feet. So you plug all that into the equation, turn the crank, and we get 
a well flow of 34 standard cubic feet per minute. That's a pretty marginal well extraction rate for fresh garbage and pretty nominal for aged refuse. So a good approximation. Well, so what? Well, using now this known volume or flow of 34 standard cubic feet per minute and the well pressure of 10 inches of water column vacuum, I can make some estimates for positive pressure development using the ideal gas law. Now, of course, landfill gas is anything but ideal, but using this equation here, um, we can ignore the uh, the uh, uh, the ideal gas laws assumptions. Basically, um, it neglects molecular size and intermolecular attractions. So landfill gases, methane and CO2, along with trace gases. And the ideal gas law is most accurate for monatomic gases at high temperatures and low pressures. But molecular size is not as critical for low pressure and high volume, which is what our scenario is with this um, gas extraction well. Very over an acre in area and 100 feet deep, that's a large volume, and the pressure is not that high, or, or low pressure actually, sub-atmospheric pressure. So we should be able to make pretty reasonable estimates of time based on mass flow creation using the ideal gas law. So now plugging or holding temperature and volume constant we can estimate the growth in landfill gas mass from operating pressure to neutral. So here's the uh, volume of the well, uh, one acre well, 100 feet deep, pressure minus 10 inches water column to a positive pressure of 0.45 inches for our factor of safety of 1.5. Same temperature, universal gas constant, so moles, what changes now are the moles of landfill gas from 4,965 to over 5,000, or a difference of basically 130 pound moles of landfill gas. Molecular weight of landfill gas is 30. So total weight of landfill gas that's going to change from this condition to that condition is 3,920 pounds. Next, we can estimate how much volume this mass takes up by determining the landfill gas specific weight. First, we'll have to eliminate water vapor or the condensate from the volume to determine dry gas volume. So using the partial pressure of water vapor at a temperature of 130 uh, degrees, uh, the partial pressure of 300 21 pounds per square foot. From that, we calculate number of moles that are, or water vapor moles that are, exist within that well column. And then the weight of the water, the volume of the water from uh, dividing the weight of the water here by steam density at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we'll figure the dry landfill gas mass and specific weight got um, uh, that volume there. Total pound moles of landfill gas, split that in two between methane and CO2, multiply by their respective molecular weights. You got these total weights of those gases within the well column. And then divide these by the well volume and we get a total gas specific weight of 0 0.06 pounds per cubic foot which is in agreement with what's out there in the literature. So, so far so good. Now for volumetric, hence mass flow rate, there are three landfill gas generation estimates. There's this one here at the lower end by these guys, referenced down below. And then um, a value from MCON back in 1980, and then uh, Rick Teal in 1990. 
99, I believe, or 90. One of those two. Anyway, it's a hot link down here where you can find this uh, article or this reference. Now, this value up here is for emissions from aged landfills. Um, the MCON and the teal generation values are can be thought of as from fresh garbage. So in perspective of this webinar, a lot more dangerous than this continuous value for aged material. So to calculate flow rates, we need in-place trash specific weight. So for freshly placed garbage, we'll go with 1,200 pounds per cubic yard, pretty nominal. For aged material, we we'll go up to 1,600 pounds per cubic yard. That allows for 25% settlement. There will be stratification within the uh, well column. Now the nature of that stratification, that's a whole nother webinar. So for simplicity and time's sake, I'm just going to assume three each, 33 foot deep zones at 1,200, 1,400, and 1,600 PCY. And I'm going to ignore the waste compression index, which would cause this volume here to decrease under the overlying weight. That's another webinar topic. So just keep it simple to go through this exercise. Now I'm going to correlate those specific weights to landfill gas generation rates. So here's teal here, here's MCON's value here, and then here's the spoke gas value down here. All that means the actual radius of influence for this well probably looks something like that versus this nice little curve line that I've got here. Now that means certain areas of that waste mass, especially in the lower lips, lips are likely under positive pressure, but they'll still be driving gas to the well bore or down to the leachate collection system, or in the case of an unlined landfill, right out the bottom into the subsurface soils. Active vacuum is likely being applied to these upper lips up here that are less dense and fresher and producing uh, higher flow rates of gas anyway than these lower lips. And well, what about that well bore itself? It's the uh, gas well field is going to wind up looking something like this. And the well bore, to avoid damaging the base liner, there's going to be some separation between the bottom of the well bore and the landfill. So you're not tearing up liner down here, which of course never, ever, ever happens. Or so you you'll hear. Uh, that separation is typically greater than in a uh, drill rig auger flight or about 20 feet so that um, you know the drillers can't lose count of their augers and then oh gee what's all that black plastic coming up. The wells uh, they don't have direct influence over these lower areas here nor do they really have direct influence over these upper regions up here. So it's advisable to connect the gas extraction system up to the uh, leachate uh, collection system cleanouts. So you can get vacuum across this uh, collection layer down below here and keep positive pressure from building up on top of that liner and provide an assist to uh, the wells here. And also you get really high quality gas to feed your power plant. Now, what about the radius of influence of this system? Well, um, I'm likely talking about a difficult or, excuse me, differential equation to describe the radius of influence as it relates to the waste density, landfill gas generation rates, and so on. So for the purposes of this um, one hour lunchtime webinar, I'm going to keep it simple and use an average radius of influence of 118 feet. And taking that, those section volumes, each one of these slices, cylindrical slices down the well column, 
multiplying by the specific weight of the trash in the upper, middle, and lower sections, and then the corresponding gas generation rates, we get these uh, landfill gas flow rates in the upper, middle, lower for a total flow of 30 standard cubic feet per minute, or pound mass 1.71 pounds per minute which is a pretty good correlation to that uh, soil vapor extraction model I showed earlier. Now I'm going to tweak with the peripheral pressure and turn that crank again. And by raising the um, peripheral pressure up to 78% of the wellhead vacuum, I get a flow rate of 30 standard cubic feet per minute. The higher this goes, is actually what you want. You want, in a well-balanced, well-field, nearly uniform pressure within the waste mass. Now, for an unsealed landfill, of course, that's not really possible because you don't want to suck in air with um, overdraw on the wells. That will cause fires. But you want to get as close to that as you can. Now, continuing, um, I divide that increase in uh, the landfill gas mass, 3,920 pounds, by that mass flow rate of 1.71 pounds per minute, implies I'll start getting neutral pressure underneath that uh, geomembrane in 1.59 days to a factor of safety of 1.5. 1.62 days to 0.6 inches or that should say 0.66 inches of water column factor of safety of 1.0. Just a few hours you can go from not having a problem to having a problem. But that's top deck condition, so not a, too much to worry about. It's more critical on the side slopes. And the issue there is the geometry is different. Now here we have typical layout on a side slope plan view. Here's a top of slope. And we have wells every 200 feet, basically. So from top of slope here to this well, to this well 200 feet, and then this guy in between both of them down below. Now the problem with this, of course, is we don't have any vacuum reach here nor here and we're not likely to get it because if drill rigs are expensive so these wells that would help push uh, vacuum reach out into this area especially these two here they're not going to be put not going to be installed not too critical as we'll we're about to see because in a profile view that radius of influence is going to look something like this for this upper slope well and then this bench well hill here, it's going to uh, follow the slope, the outside surface slope of the landfill, and then the baseliner area in here. Now, side slope gas extraction can subject the system to air intrusion in uh, sites without final cover, basically. So you've got air flowing in through the surface here into this system. Like I said before, that can cause fires. Not a good thing. Um, these wells can also tap into the leachate collection system down here. As you can see, this geocomposite is heading up the slope and then gets into the influence area of this well. So all of a sudden, you can get gas flow rates out of these wells that don't make any sense. This is probably what's happening. Now, if we take uh, one-third sections of the um, uh, slope system as before, um, this upper section here is just over 83,000 cubic feet using a 200-foot well spacing. The uh, middle volume here is 250 thousand cubic feet and then the lower is 416 and some change from this uh, band here through here. Now the well now converting that into 
cubic yards, applying the specific weights and those gas generation rates, I can make an estimate of landfill gas flow that is occurring within the confines or uh, say the horizontal projection of this slope here. So about 4.4 cubic feet per minute and then uh, corresponding mass flow per day. Now applying the ideal gas law to this situation, um, we come up with these initial um, molecular weight or uh, molar content of gas in the upper, middle, and lower slopes at a operating pressure of uh, 10 inches water column vacuum, positive pressure of 0.45, positive pressure of 0.66 for that factor of safety of 1.0. And here we've got the changes in um, uh, molecular mass of landfill gas, dry gas, and then the actual weight change in dry gas. And we plug that, divide those mass flow or changes in mass by the mass flow rate and we get days to factor of safety for 1.5 and 1.0. Upper slope reaches 1.5 and 1.7 days, 1.0 and 1.75 days or we're talking hours, same for the middle slope. Lower slope takes a few more days to start causing trouble. However, remember that lower slope can also receive gas migration from the LCRS system when the system goes down. So this might be a little too comforting because pressure can build up from all this gas moving this way. Another sidebar, um, that geocomposite drainage layer, when it's placed during baseline or construction, it's typically going to be tucked into this anchor trench. Now, before final cover is placed on this slope and then baseliner is sealed to the final cover, that anchor trench can allow uh, off-site gas migration. So just a sidebar, seen it happen, it's an issue, be aware of it. So now the top deck and side slopes, well, they can reach instability within hours of each other as shown here. Top deck versus upper slope, middle slope, a few hours apart. So basically no weekends for you. Um, is this a catastrophe waiting to happen with closure turf? Uh, no, no. Uh, the tensile strength of the super grip net component will absorb that stress. I'm not going to show you how to calculate that simply because we don't recommend that at all. That's um, uh, just not recommended. So how to avoid uh, the pressure buildup beneath the geomembrane? Well, everyone's been waiting for this part, but first I want to get over it. Okay, well, um, agro and watershed management weigh it in, so let's go right to the equation or the calculation or the landfill gas control with closure turf here. Anyway, Rick Till recommends using a granular sand layer beneath geomembranes to act as um, surficial landfill gas collection and send that gas to uh, collection strips and then to vents or extraction points to keep that pressure from building up. Kerner's advised you can use a geotextile to do the same thing. So if you don't want to sling sand down, you can throw down some geotextile that'll um, act as a collection blanket. Uh, for super grip net and the closure turf system, um, side slopes, top decks, the, uh, the grip side of the super grip net will have a nominal gap between the sheet and the subgrade soil right here. And that gap will allow gas passage. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, well, no, yeah, no. 
what about infiltration in subtitle D equivalents that I put in on in uh, the part one webinar? Well, in that equivalence demonstration, you got to remember that Drew's contact quality coefficient of 0 0.21 is for good contact, which is right here, according to his um, uh, paper that he wrote with uh, Rupert Bonaparte. Um, it's not for minimum um, values of uh, leakage, nor perfect contact, nor even best or test condition contact. It's good. So some gap is expected between the geomembrane and the subgrade soil. This condition would also apply to Teal's sand layer and Kerner's geotextile layer. Also remember the driving hydraulic head for closure turf it's a much, much, much lower than the standard final cover veneer with, say, an 18 to 24 inch um, soil cover layer above the geomembrane and its um, uh, drain, sub-drainage layer. Now, to know if that gap will exist, let's uh, first determine the bearing force in the individual grip. The closure turf system weighs about six pounds, as we saw before. There's a grip for every 1.44 square inches. So the load per grip for a six pound per square foot overlying load on a three to one slope is simply this, 0 0.057 pounds. So not a lot of weight on each one of these grips. Now the total cone surface area of that grip is uh, 0 0.032 inches is found from that equation for surface area of a cone. Now here I'm going to assume that the bearing force of the soil acts perpendicularly to the cone surface. Note that I am ignoring friction interface forces along the cone surface and the soil and adhesive forces. I'm just assuming the bearing or bearing uh, force of the soil itself against the cone. So what I'm about to show is you can call it conservative. Now that grip load, we'll divide that grip load by the area of the cone and then the angle here, um, the sign of this angle here to determine what that force is. It's about 6 psi or 860 pounds per square foot which is about a third to a half of nominal soil bearing pressure. So let's assume we got an uncompacted silty clay sand subgrade, um, typical intermediate soil cover with a bearing capacity of, well, let's say about 2000 PSF. And divide that or um, back calculate for area of a cone using those numbers that we knew previously and the area of the cone penetrating into the subgrade soil is 0 0.0137 inches square inches which means h sub i or the depth of penetration of the uh, grip into the soil is 115 mils and that means this gap is 60 mil. Now, I'm going to assume that gas will flow in between these grips here in that 60 mil gap. So right along this line here, those gaps are about 101.06 inches apart. So each landfill gas flow channel will be basically one square foot across the entire width of a super grip net sheet. Now, if I assume, in my opinion, conservatively, that the entire operating side slope landfill gas flow of 4.4 standard cubic feet per minute distributes across that entire slope, the gas flux for that entire slope, 200 feet between wells, 158 feet long for a 3 to 1 slope, 50 feet high, is 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4 standard cubic feet per minute per
per square foot. So the landfill gas flow from each channel is same number since we're talking one square foot. Now before I can calculate a pressure drop from sheet center to edge, I got to confirm laminar flow conditions. Now Reynolds number is found from this equation here where pipe diameter I'm going to use as the gap or 60 mil and then landfill gas flow velocity, flow density 0 0.06 pounds per cubic foot, gas viscosity at this which number I got from MCON and the flow velocity for the flow velocity cross-sectional area is the gap times the distance between the grips. So here's that 4.4 uh, times 10 to minus 4 square feet, small areas, divide by that flow volume that's occurring within this um, flow channel. And we have a velocity of 0.32 feet per minute or 0 0.00 feet per second. So now, plug all those numbers into the uh, Reynolds number equation, turn the crank, and we have a Reynolds number of 54, which is, indicates laminar. So now I can estimate the pressure drop from uh, across this sheet using Darcy Weisbach, or this equation here. And this is a unit converted equation version of Darcy Weisbach to report pressure drop in inches of water column. Uh, Moody friction factor and it can be found from this equation here, 64 divided by the Reynolds number when it's less than 500. The reason less than 500 is above 500, that's considered to be a transition zone from laminar to turbulent, which is a different equation. Pipe diameter is same, flow length, landfill gas flow velocity. So now we've got um, pressure drop underneath a sheet of super drip net at zero inches. It's not even measurable underneath an individual um, sheet of super drip net to vent this gas flow. Well, what about the complete system? Well, uh, landfill gas collection system along a slope using closure turf will have a configuration like this. Um, out here in the field is the um, super grip net sheet, let's say, an extra strip of super grip net running from toe to top of slope here, or bench as the case may be, and then another um, super grip net street strip running from that point to the vent or extraction point. So kind of channelized flow here, here, and then field flow out here. Now the longest run for landfill gas flow would be from the center of the field here. Let's call this 50 feet. And going through the equations, we come up with a pressure drop of 0 0.07 inches of water column. Now assuming the gas will split direction to top and bottom. It doesn't really care about whether it's going downhill or not since it's a gas. Um, we can assume that uh, half of it will head this way, half of it that way in a half strip um, using 12 inches here. So the strip is actually 24 inches long, but the other 12 inch width here is taking care of gas flow from this field out here. Pressure drop there is uh, 0.36 inches, so total is 0.43 inches, approaching our factor of safety of 1.5, but still okay. Let's see what happens when we add this strip in here. Now that's 100 feet, um, another half strip, so 24 inches of this strip are conveying 0.55 standard cubic feet per minute to the vent. Um, flow here, um, or the pressure drop here is 0.23 inches. So total pressure drop to this uh, vent extraction point is now 0.66 inches. So 
we're starting to get into unstable conditions. So instead, let's try a pipe, a four inch diameter uh, pipe in like a French drain. And now I've got to increase the flow in that pipe because it's going to also take care of this flow from this upper slope up here. And now we've got a pressure drop of basically a measurable. So we're back down to 0 0.43 inches of water column. So, okay, pipe up here, strip here, should be all right. Now this corresponds nicely with the typical uh, relief valve layout advised by um, watershed geosynthetics for landfill top decks here. They got a malfunction valve basically every acre in the centroids of minimal active landfill gas extraction or in some cases positive gas pressure buildup. So these uh, malfunction valves, they can also be hooked up to active extraction here to uh, control that gas beneath the final cover system. Well, what about the head loss across this vent? Well, the vent looks something like this. It's a three foot long piece of two inch diameter PVC up to a vent cap up here. Now the flow through this vent, let's say all 4.4 standard cubic feet per minute from that slope are thrown, flowing through this vent. We got a Reynolds number even by classic um, methods is transitioning from laminar to turbulent flow. So our Darcy flow assumption is breaking down. Well, Moody had an app for that in pipe flow anyway where you can estimate the friction factor in the Darcy Weisbach equation using this equation here for Reynolds numbers that are transitional to turbulent flow. Epsilon in this case is the pipe roughness, absolute roughness, a uh, measurement in feet. So we'll use a roughness measurement for HDPE pipe uh, PVC is somewhat lower than this, but we'll go with 0 0.407 feet and determine that the friction factor is about 0 0.02 for a 2-inch diameter pipe. So, plug those numbers into the uh, Darcy Weisbach equation, turn the crank, and we get not really measurable pressure drop across this system for that flow volume. All that for a big so what? Well, not exactly. The vent, if you want a vent with a um, backflow prevention, uh, the vent opens at a pressure of 0 0.5 inches of water column. Therefore, instead of those uh, super grip net strips for uh, gas conveyance. You're going to have to use pipe everywhere for, say, like a passive system to keep the uh, uh, pressure beneath the GM membrane from getting too high. So one caveat there on using these vent systems. On the other hand, if it's passive system and you're below the local air quality requirements um, and can freely passively vent. Um, you don't need the uh, backflow prevention device on here really as most of the existing vents out there are free flowing. So that's uh, some, something else to take consideration in your design work. Speaking of, um, what we saw today is the closure turf final cover system can accommodate uh, gas buildup after an active gas system crash or passive venting within reason. The next webinar will get into landfill gas system components that uh, you can use for a passive or active control system. Um, but one thing is if you do have a site with an active landfill gas control system, 
it likely has a rudimentary artificial intelligence, if you will, or an auto dialer system that will call, text, or email you that a fault has occurred and it, and it shut itself down. So response time can be cut down to hours versus more dangerous days. Some auto dialer systems are getting pretty sophisticated in that you can, uh, you can restart the system remotely. There is an app for that. After the operator uh, has scanned the fault report that the system sent to him over his smartphone or his email or what have you or called him, um, he can determine whether that cause can wait for attention on Monday and then go ahead and tell the system to start itself back up and then go back to fishing. So there are the uh, gas control systems can be designed to accommodate the risk presented by uh, pressure buildup beneath final cover systems. So the next webinar um, will also be with Delaney Lewis of Watershed Geosynthetics. He's in particular the uh, uh, lead at Watershed regarding gas control in landfills. He's been around landfills pretty much his entire career. He's one of the smartest guys I've ever met in my life. And uh, he's going to be here to talk about active extraction systems using the various components available for use with closure turf, along with me talking the usual engineered stuff. So anyway, that's next webinar. We'll be sending out announcements for that and hope to see you there. Uh, also, for those of you needing uh, PDH credit, uh, it's available in the states noted, um, Washington, California, Arizona, Hawaii don't require it yet, and then some states out here in the east um, were not eligible to offer PDH credit because of their accreditation rules. So anyway, uh, need a PDH credit, give myself or Nathan Ivey a holder and we'll get you set up. And uh, uh, by phone or email at these numbers and then hope to see you next time. So anyway, that's our end of our presentation. Next time, active gas extraction with the closure dirt system. Thanks for attending and we'll see you next time.